So let's uh, do a news of the day type thing because it's Monday. If you're in Canada, it's Easter Monday. If you're in the rest of the world, it's what's East, what's Easter Monday? I think I think it's just Canada that there's... And Easter Monday is less and less of a thing, it seems, as years go by. But anyways, that's a whole other whole other thing. Um, and there's going to be people going, oh, he is in Canada. Right, yeah. Newer subscribers. Um, <clears throat> so news of the day kind of thing. So the Toronto media has to cover everything. But this is interesting. The Toronto Maple Leafs sat down at a team meeting before their flight to Boston. The number one thing for the Toronto Maple Leafs right now, don't focus on last year. Don't worry about 2013. Don't worry about things you can't change. Focus on Game 7, going to Boston and doing what you did in Games 1, Game 3, and Game 5. This this is, again, this is the thing, right? They've won 3 out of 7 against the Bruins twice. And they're trying to avoid doing it that third time. And I, I, I do think they have a chance. They have the star players. They have the goaltender. They have a pretty darn good team. A lot of it at this point, I think there is something with the, the psychological part of it. And I think uh, last last night, I think we saw some of that. Well, yesterday afternoon. I think we saw some of that uh, in their, I don't know, their approach to the game. I think they, they could have, if if they had played the whole game the way they did the last 10 minutes, they, they could have knocked Boston out yesterday. It's just, I think a lot. I think there is some of it that's psychological. All right. Patrick Laine has come out now that the Jets are out and said he was dealing with a back injury during the regular season and a groin injury during the playoffs. Uh, and he said, don't worry, it's not a big deal. Well, considering those huge scoring slumps he was having and how we were watching him and going, I don't, I don't know who this guy is. This isn't the way he was playing last year. That back injury might have been a bigger deal than he's admitting. Um, in that, you know, maybe it doesn't require surgery, didn't really require him to be out of the lineup, but he wasn't fully effective as he would have been if he'd rested it, um, had something done with it. So this is this is where that happens this time of year. And uh, Wheeler, Shifley, and Line have all said they're not playing in the Worlds, which shouldn't surprise anybody. Uh, when you, you get knocked out of the playoffs and it's a bitter pill to swallow at this time of year, uh, it, it is hard to, to put on a jersey and go over and play in the World Championships, which is why I respect players that go over and do it after being eliminated from the playoffs. I think that is, um, you know, that, that that's that's a pretty strong indication of how much they love the game. Not that these guys don't. Uh, it's just, you know, if you can strap that on after you get knocked out of the playoffs, pff, man, that's good job. Uh, that being said, moving along, uh, Rickard Gronborg has emerged as a coaching candidate for Buffalo. Buffalo may look to Europe for their coaching, and, and you know what? It can work. Uh, I know it's it's rare. I know it's rare that a European coach comes in and coaches in the NHL, uh, and it's had mixed results in the past when it's happened. But you know what? It can work. And as long as their English is okay, I don't see any reason why it's why it would be a big deal. And it might be a smart move for Buffalo in that their favorite candidates may already be gone off the market. So we'll see if Buffalo actually does that. Uh, oh, she's had a surgery um, on his clavicle and uh, he's out indefinitely. That just sounds painful. That's broken collarbone. And I don't know if they did the surgery to reset it or what they did, but man, I tell you. Uh, so for people who think, oh, she might be faking it a little bit or, oh, she's just, yeah, he's just a wuss. Not really. Uh, broken collarbone that that's got to hurt like hell. So, uh, he's, he may be out for the playoffs. We don't know yet. Uh, and then the news that, that everybody's been talking about over the last couple of days, I haven't seen the fallout over the Norris contenders just over Vesna and everybody lost their minds. Uh, Vasilevsky, Bishop and Leonard were named as the Vesna candidates over the weekend. To which everybody said, pardon? Including me. Uh, because all season I've been arguing that Bishop and Leonard didn't play enough. Not only that, but Leonard and Grice, their numbers were virtually identical. So to me, because Grice played almost the same amount of games as Leonard and their numbers were pretty darn close, you couldn't really say Leonard was the best goalie in the league without saying Grice kind of was too. So for that reason, for me... I thought, well, it should be Vassy. I thought Freddie Anderson should be in the conversation. I could understand why some thought Flurry belonged in the conversation, and I don't want to take away from Flurry, but I thought he was better last year than this year, and last year he wasn't nominated. I was okay with that because he didn't play enough games, but he played the same amount of games as these guys. So last year we have 
Fleury doesn't make it into the conversation because he doesn't play enough. And this year he plays more than these guys. And again, he's not one of the top three. Uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll see if Vassy ends up winning it because the odds on odds seem to be in favor of Vasilevsky winning it overall. Uh, and, and the conversation being, is it going to be awkward at the award show with Tampa Bay taking home all of these awards after being swept in the first round? The answer to that is yes. Uh, but it, it does raise an interesting question, like, because to me, I was, as, as a Dallas fan, I was fine with Bishop not being in the top three, because I thought, no, Bishop was injured for large portions of this year. And I have said, I think if a guy's injured for 20 plus games, that, yeah, you know, you should, you should, the award should go towards somebody who's played that full season or close to it. Now, before we can get mad at writers, because sports writers pick a lot of the other awards, sports writers do not pick Vesna. That's the GMs. So the general managers are responsible for this. So if you're going to get angry with somebody, uh, that's that's where you direct that. And the GMs clearly this year decided, you know what? We don't care how many games a guy played. If he played well enough, he deserves uh, consideration. And... Uh, We'll see if Vasilevsky does win it. Because there have been a lot of conversations about, oh, Ben Bishop should win it. And for me, it was, yeah, Bishop has great numbers. He's been great all year, but he's been injured a lot. So And and also, the argument I made with Leonard also kind of stands with Bishop in that Hudobin's numbers were fantastic as well. So, whereas with Vasi, you could say, well, they won a lot without Vasilevsky, which is true, but Demang's numbers are a lot lower than Vasilevsky's. So Vasilevsky's overall numbers were much better. Uh, now, on the Norris side of things, the argument's going to be a simple one of Giordano or Bust, right? Uh, Victor Hedman being in there may surprise some, doesn't surprise me. Victor Hedman is a beast out there, and when he's healthy, he was not healthy in the playoffs, made a huge difference in that series. Uh, Brent Burns is going to surprise some people, but he had the most points by a defenseman since Brian Leach in 95-96. And as much as we dislike points deciding who a great defenseman is, that will be a factor. And yes, this means that there's a lot of guys we've been talking about and whether or not they might get Norris consideration that are not in the top three because Brent Burns gets in there. And the funny thing is, it was last year I was talking about Burns playing really well and I thought Burns might get some consideration. His plus minus said otherwise. Uh, this year, he's been pretty offensively consistent, but there will be a lot of detractors based on his overall defensive game. And I think that will rule him out. I, I do think Giordano, who had a career year at age 35, I think Giordano's the guy. Uh, but we'll see, right? And and Hedman kind of did what I thought. At the start of the year, there was a lot of talk about Ryan McDonough. And I said, you know, McDonough's having a great year. But when you share a blue line with Victor Hedman, Hedman's going to be the guy who gets the Norris votes. And that's where we are. So we'll see what happens. Uh, like I said, I, I expect Giordano to win here. And I expect Vasilevsky to win, but we'll see. I would imagine the Calder vote, the Hart vote, still, uh, they haven't revealed the nominations there yet. I would think Calder would be um, Patterson, Darlene, and and uh, Bennington. And maybe this vote makes me think that maybe Bennington does have a shot at Rookie of the Year. Because uh, the argument has been Bennington didn't play enough. Well... If that's been knocked down by the Vezina vote, maybe the Calder vote gets knocked down that way as well. Maybe Bennington can win Rookie of the Year. Maybe we're seeing a, a change in the way that, that the awards are, get, are handed out and missing half a season, a third of a season, a half or, or a quarter of a season. Maybe that's not the death knell for your chances at an award that it used to be. But we'll find out in June. Between now and then, we've got three more rounds of playoffs after this one's done. And uh, a lot of interesting twists and turns this league's going to take. So there you go. Uh, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. You just happened upon this video. And hey, thank you guys so much for watching, for all your support. I'll talk to you again soon.